Instagram.com. So I'll probably never forget this patient for as long as I live. I was asked to see a patient, brand new, never seen them before, walked into the ICU room. It was a young gentleman. He was on the ventilator, and his mother, his caregiver, was there by the bedside. As I started to get more history from the mother, I started to notice out of the corner of my eye that the vitals monitor was showing that his heart rate was in the 80s. No problem. After about a minute or so, it was in the 70s. After further talking to the mother, I noticed that it had gotten down into the 60s now, and I knew something was up. Uh, by the time I got to the chart to see what was going on, it was in the 50s. I started to have some concerns and some suspicions. When I looked at the labs, I think I knew what was going on at that point, and a few more chart checks, and I knew exactly what was happening. I told the nurse to quickly pull up a medication, to give the medication as soon as possible, went back into the room. It was now in the 30s. And by the time the nurse came in, I didn't want to alarm the mother, but she could see that something was going on. And I told the nurse to give that medication as soon as possible. As soon as she gave that medication, literally within five or six seconds, the patient was about to go into cardiac arrest, but everything came back to normal. And the patient was now doing much, much better. What was it that happened? What was the diagnosis? What did I need to confirm before I gave that medication? And what was that medication that I gave that saved that patient from a sure near cardiac arrest? Let's talk. Hi, I'm Dr. Roger Schwelt, co-founder of MedCram.com. Today, we're going to talk about a case that highlights the need to know and understand off the cuff some EKG findings. You see, as I was looking at that patient, in the corner of my eye, the vitals monitor not only has the heart rate and the blood pressure, but it also has a few leads that you can look at. It had one or two leads total, but even because you're able to see those leads, you're able to see something called a peaked T wave, and you can see that right there. This thing right here is a peak T wave. And notice you can see that it's almost the same height or in some cases even higher than the QRS complex. When you see something like that, you want to consider hyperkalemia or an elevated potassium level. So let's talk a little bit about what goes on inside the cell. And that will give us a little bit of information about what's going on. So here's the cell. And here's outside the cell, let's just say the blood, essentially. And we'll abbreviate potassium as K. And generally, there's a lot of potassium that is stored inside the cells and a small relative amount of potassium that is outside the cells. And as a result of that, potassium likes to go down its concentration gradient and go outside the cell. And so when this happens, generally it leaves behind a large negative charge, and outside there is a relatively large positive charge. It is more complicated than this, but we're gonna leave it to this explanation for today. If you wanna know more about this and the complexities of it, I highly recommend our EKG course. Why did I suspect that this patient had hyperkalemia? Well, it was because I could see that there was some peak T waves out of the corner of my eye on the vitals monitor. And I had just known that the patient was intubated. And generally speaking, they're given medications for intubation. And sure enough, I went back to the chart and noticed that the patient was given Atomidate, 20 milligrams, and also succinylcholine, 100 milligrams. So the automate is to make the patient go to sleep. And the reason why we give succinylcholine is to let all of the muscles relax. It's called a paralytic, and it allows the tube to go down more easily without the patient tensing up and preventing that from going down. The problem with succinylcholine is that it's a depolarizing paralytic, which means that when it causes the paralysis, it does it in a way that causes a depolarization, which then causes more potassium to go outside the cell. When I looked in this patient's chart when they first came into the hospital and had blood tests, the patient's potassium was 6.0 in the blood. And normally it should be 3.5 to 5.0. So the patient's potassium was already elevated. And if you can imagine here, the patient's potassium is higher. And as a result of that, it went even higher when the patient was given succinylcholine. So high potassium 
causes this diffusion of potassium outside the cells to go at a more slow rate because there isn't a big a difference. The result of that is that this positive and negative charge is not as great. There is a smaller positive charge and a smaller negative charge when you have significant hyperkalemia. And what that does is it causes the P wave, the QRS, and the T wave, which is normal here, to turn into a smaller P wave, a wider QRS, and a more peaked T wave. And these are the kind of changes you see as it gets worse. You see even longer QRS and even higher peak T waves. And then finally, what you just start to see as the potassium gets even higher is almost like a sinusoidal type of situation. And honestly, this is what I was looking at as the nurse was pushing in medications. What kind of medication would I give in this kind of case? Let's hold off on that. Let's talk about what is typically given in patients with hyperkalemia and some of the strategies that you can do to get that potassium down. The first one that you can give is bicarbonate. Bicarbonate is negatively charged. It likes to bind to protons. And when you bind protons, because there is an exchange that happens here in the plasma membrane where protons go out and potassium goes in, this type of administration of IV bicarbonate is one way of temporarily shifting potassium back into the cell. It's temporary. It takes some time. And because it takes some time, it would not be the medication that I would have given in this situation. But it is one that does work over a long period of time. Give it about an hour or so. Another one you could give is glucose and insulin. Because insulin, as it goes into the cell and brings glucose in with it, also brings potassium into the cell as well. This does take some time as well. It does not work within seconds as we might like for it to be. But again, because of that, it is a good medication if you want to eventually bring potassium down. However, it is temporary because you're only shifting it into the cell. It's going to come out eventually. And again, it doesn't work fast enough for what I asked the nurse to give in our case. Another thing you could give is albuterol because there's a beta receptor and when albuterol stimulates the beta receptor, and we're talking about a nebulized solution of albuterol, that also has a tendency to shift potassium into the cell. This is actually the fastest way to shift potassium into the cell. But again, remember, it's temporary. And even though it's the fastest way that we know to shift potassium into the cell, it's still not fast enough to be the medication that I asked the nurse to give in this situation. So all of these are good strategies to shift potassium. But there are some strategies to actually get rid of potassium. One of them is binders. Binders that actually bind potassium in the gut and exchange it for sodium. So the potassium will come on to these binders and they will release sodium or protons back into the solution. And of course, when you excrete out the binder, the potassium goes with it. So this is a way of actually getting rid of it. It's not temporary, it's not shifting. You are actually physically getting it out of the body. Problem is it takes too long and it wouldn't be something that we would give in this situation. Some binders would include localma or k -exalate. Kxlate has been given traditionally. There are some side effects. There are also side effects with Lokelma, although not as many. It is given in the GI tract, and there are side effects that you have to watch out for when giving those type of medications. Let's look at the most obvious way, right? Hemodialysis. Hemodialysis is a fairly quick way if you've got to hook them up to a dialysis catheter, which can take about 20 to 30 minutes. And then you also have to get the dialysis machine in there. And again, it takes some time, about three to four hours for that dialysate to move through, generally speaking. And usually if it's the first time they're getting it, it's just about two hours or three. And still, it's not going to work in seconds. So these are options, but not the options that we gave in this case. So what did we give in this case? In cardiac tissue specifically, the most important ion in determining the resting potential in cardiac tissue is potassium. It is because of this diffusion down its concentration gradient that you have this generally negative, let's do it in yellow here, this negative charge inside the cell and this positive charge outside the cell. And it's this large difference that stabilizes the cell membrane in the heart tissue. If you don't have that, 
you're going to get something like this. If you do have it, this is what you get and this is what you want. So what happens when potassium levels are very high? As you can see here, potassium is not going to want to go down its concentration gradient if the potassium outside is very great. And as a result of that, you're going to get slower egress of potassium outside of the cell. As a result of that, you're going to get a lower positive charge, absolutely, and a lower negative charge. And so what happens now is that the potential across this membrane has become less and destabilized. And this is the type of issue that you get. So how do we restabilize that? Well, we can either make this interior negative charge more negative, or we can make this outside charge more positive. And of course, when we're giving intravenous medications, it's going into the blood. So we have to pick a ion that is highly positively charged. So I asked the nurse to give calcium chloride. Calcium chloride was given quickly, and what it did was it caused a lot of positive charges to line up over the membrane. And remember again, calcium is actually two positive charges. So for every calcium ion that's coming in, we're going to get two positive charges. This potential difference then increased very rapidly and we were able to go back from a very dangerous looking rhythm to a very happy looking rhythm. This is also very transient, probably even more transient than some of the solutions that we talked about before, but it's extremely fast acting. Literally, within seconds of giving that medication, I saw that the patient's heart rate went from the 50s up to the 60s, 70s, 80s, that the QRS got very nice and narrow, and that peak T wave resolved. I then went back and did all of the things that we talked about that shift potassium temporarily that take a little bit longer, and I was also able to get potassium out of the body using some of the techniques that we talked about with the resin binders, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And of course, the succinylcholine weared off, and so the hyperkalemia cause wore off, and we were able to adequately treat this patient. But understanding in that moment what was going on was key and critical to saving that patient from a definite cardiac arrest situation. Again, here is an example of peak T waves. You can see these issues here, and it's something to watch out for in your patients. And I wanted to let you know about our EKG course on our website, medcram.com. Over a thousand reviews, 4.9 out of five stars. You can see the quote there, the best in-depth explanation that I've received in my 20-year medical career is what someone said about our video. In fact, there are residency programs that use our course as their training for their first-year interns to get well acquainted with the EKG, actually some emergency room residency programs. And why is that? It's because our EKG course shows you the understanding of the heart's electrical activity. There's illustrations, a systematic approach, there's hands-on EKG interpretation, and it's not given by people without medical knowledge. We're combining this with years of clinical experience, and because of that, there's actually more clinical experience that you can get out of this course. 10 CME units, Category 1 for physicians, MOC points, but we also give CE credits as well, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, also respiratory therapists. If you're not in the medical field, but you want to know how to interpret the ECG that you see on your watch, this is also a great resource for you. We go through it methodically, slowly, we test at every level, and we make sure that you understand how to interpret an ECG. Great. Well, I hope this case was instructive. Uh, for me, it was definitely a learning experience in the fact that I was able to keep my cool while the patient and the family member were in the room, and I was able to treat the patient effectively. So if you like this, please subscribe, turn on notifications, leave a comment below if you've had a similar experience, and join us at medcram.com.